of all, I want to thank uh, Christina Laurie for inviting me and Suzanne uh, Packer for, uh, and you'll see that there's a wonderful connection between her art and a poem of mine, which is a surprise for later. Um, I just put that two and two together. Um, and the Cape Cod branch of the National League of American Pen Women for inviting me for their National Poetry Month celebration. And yes, mostly what I'm going to talk about is getting published. And uh, I'm also, I might read a few of the poems that are, are mine in the journal so, so that you can hear more than from the piece of paper, you can hear what might fit a journal. So, um, one of the things of the, uh, the beautiful um, uh, flyer that Suzanne created said is that uh, she's going to say why she started Calliope. So I am the founding director of Calliope, a monthly poetry series at the West Falmouth Library. It began as a series in January of 2008. The prior April of 2007, we had our very first reading there. And um, why I started it was because it, there was nothing like this on the other. And if you think back, that's pretty astounding that in the last six plus years, poetry has just sort of taken off. So I think you're on the cutting edge of things that are going to continue. To be a, a cultural event, just like a concert, just like an art opening, where people are now coming to poetry who are not themselves poets. And I'm very proud that we built an audience of people who don't write poetry. They come to listen, and that I think is amazing. So, what I'm going to first of all say, the best thing you can do to get published is to write, and write, and write, and revise, and revise, and revise, and have, if you can, either a group that you take your poems to, or a reader who will read and give you honest feedback. And the thing I'm going to say about publishing, I call it, you need to find a publishing pal. That's somebody who's going to sort of help you stay focused, stay organized. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. <clears throat> Initially, when I, I started writing officially that I would read them out loud to anybody in 2003. Um, the Barnstable Unitarian Church had a poetry group. I led it, Roger Kessel founded it. He was my publishing pal. For years, I would read like the old Sears Roebuck catalog, Poets Market, which I suggest for those of us who like to touch things, that you um, pick up a copy. It's every two years. It lists every journal, every grant, every residency, everything. So this is sort of our poetry bible for markets for, for your poems. If you haven't subscribed to it, I would suggest also subscribing to Poets and Writers, which as you see, I uh, mark for poetry contests. Um, so I would read this like the Sears Roebuck catalog, which is why I never buy anything, because once I read it, I'm so overwhelmed I can't figure out where to start. So Roger and I would meet twice a year. Um, he found some journals, he got in, and that would spur me on to try to get in. So we would sort of, in a friendly, competitive way, push each other to stay focused and to publish. Um, there was a lovely, there is a lovely um, woman who's now probably 94. The first reading at Calliope, before it became a series, Lynn McDonald featured. She was probably 80 at the time. Her strategy for getting published was this. This is the strategy I don't want you to use. She knew two journals. She has no email, okay, so she's not on the net. She had Poetry Magazine and The New Yorker. So she'd write, and she's a great writer. She wrote, and she'd send them to Poetry Magazine, and then they'd get rejected. So then she'd send it to The New Yorker, and then she'd get rejected. And so she ended up thinking she did, wasn't a good poet. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so Roger and I together met with her. He organized her chapbook, uh, which came out for her 90th birthday party. She did not want it. She self-published it. She did not want to, to do the marketing. <clears throat> and I said, let's make a strategy <clears throat> for you. We ended up getting her into eight journals within two years. So that, 
that gives you some sense that it, it is a strategy to how to get published. So, um, in your packet, the first thing probably in your packet, I hope, I'm the poet, I'm always the poet with um, commercials, um, is, it's, it's cut off because I'm a terrible Xeroxer, but it's the Catherine Lee Bates Poetry Contest, it's up and coming, um, and I told um, Glenn Neely uh, that I would be glad to pass it out because the deadline is Friday, May 24th, and um, usually, um, it, it's, I'm going to say just a couple of things about contests. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on contests. Contests are tough. But Veterans for Peace on the Cape has a, a yearly contest, and the Catherine Lee Bates and the Cultural Center of Cape Cod has a contest. I usually do the Cultural Center of Cape Cods, which means it co usually, this one is not, but usually it costs you money, you submit to a contest, and why I do the Cultural Center of Cape Cods is because that funds their teen poetry program. So it's half of a fundraiser, and usually I get to be third runner-up, like in the Miss America contest, I never have actually been crowned as the Cape Cod poet. Um, but the, another um, contest I'm going to mention, this is, um, these are the non-academic journals. These are the independent journals. It's the Naugatuck uh, River Review, a journal of narrative poetry that sings. For those who like to write narrative poems, think about the uh, Naugatuck River Review. They have two editions. They, this is their contest issue. So you just Google Nagatech River Review, but the contest funds the journal. Without the contest, there would be no journal. So I don't, I don't subscribe to a lot of contests. I'm very careful about how many of these I do, but I pick the ones that seem to be in service of the greater community. <clears throat> okay, I've done that. Now, you also have in your packet, um, I'm in, on the board of, the advisory board of the Mass Poetry Festival. And the only reason why I'm bringing it up today, there are several Cape Cod poets up there. It's the first weekend in May, it's, therefore it's next weekend. There is a wonderful book fair, and you can go and, and see the journals and the uh, publishers, and it's in Salem, Massachusetts. So, let me tell you about my strategy for getting published, and I'll say since 2003, I started sending things out late 2006, uh, 2000, early 2007. So in the last six years, I've gotten 25 poems into print journals and five poems online. And that's because I try very hard to do it when Clivey doesn't meet, and we can talk about that, but I have this strategy, which I'll share with you about how to aim for where you're going to get in, because it's always an up to get an acceptance. For those 30 journals, I probably have 300 rejections. So don't take rejection personally. Just know that there will be a home for your poems, and you just haven't found it yet, and you have to be deliberate and sort of intentional about where you're sending your poems. And when I read some of the ones that are in the journals, hopefully it'll start to... So, okay, done that. So let me tell you about sending things out, the practical side. Usually every... Okay, this is the statistics for the better journals. Journals like Plowshares, they get 5,000 submissions, they publish 90 a year. So, that tells you to write, 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 revise. And then I would say take it to an open mic at Calliope, hopefully. You'll hear if your, if your poem succeeds. You can hear people fall out of your poem if you haven't revised enough. You'll hear it as a little thud. It's just a little tiny thud, but you'll hear it. The first thing I would suggest you to do is, is to write a letter to the editor and say, please send me a sample copy of your journal. 
And then I collected maybe 50 journals. And I have a group and we sometimes trade journals because you can't do it all yourself. If you have a writer's group or you have a, a publishing pal, each of you select for a year that you want to start to read. Then several of the journals, especially the independent ones, you should subscribe to the journal. If you want to increase your chances to be one of the 90. Um, so, for example, um, this year I've subscribed to Plowshares, sent in, you know, and it'll say, and they have sample uh, uh, cover letters. There is a sample cover letter also in your packet. You know, as a first time uh, subscriber, I read with great pleasure such and such a poem. Lose it a little bit, but tell them you've read the journal. I, because I read Calliope, I'll say a poet colleague, blah, 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 you know, suggested I consider sending. It, the poet colleague, by the way, is just in that journal. So make it personal, make it specific, do your homework, and you'll have a much better chance of succeeding. It's not nearly as bad as buying a lottery ticket. So if you do that, um, and I'll, I'll give you an example later, uh, with Off the Coast, I probably took me four years to get it off the coast. Roger got in first, and I was like, I'm going to get it off the coast. I had gotten the sample, I had borrowed journals, and basically at one point they said, it's an independent journal, they don't make a lot of money. They said, uh, you'd have a better chance if you were a subscriber. So I subscribed for about two, two years. They still rejected me for two years. I subscribed for the third year and finally I got a poem in Off the Coast. And I'm only saying this because it, you don't make a lot of money in poetry. You don't make a lot of money. Now usually you're, you're, you might get paid two free copies of the journal. That's your, I don't think I've ever gotten any money actually for any of the poems that got published. Um, and why I do it is because it makes me take the craft more seriously. And in fact, and I'll end with a story, a recent story. So uh, essentially, what I'm going to also share is how you work. So it's you get a sample, you read it, you decide which to subscribe to. Right now, I'm subscribing to Prairie Schooner, Paul Shares, Agni, and what's the fourth one? There's four. Uh, Comstock Review. Okay. As soon as I sent off to publishers, it was like back in my mailbox as a rejection within 30 seconds. <laughs> so it, it's not like you're going to get a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. Should there be a cover letter? Um, one person uh, asked me, so there is a cover letter that tells me how I choose, uh, and I put a, a very short bio in. You know, I've read to, to the Comstock. I have followed your journal for several years. Uh, as fellow workshop members, Gary Whitehead and Sandra Kohler's poems have a will appear in your journal. It tells them, oh, I, I actually know people and they're recommending you and you make it personal. Um, somebody asked me, oh, Robert Bly doesn't do cover letters and I don't think I need to do a cover letter. I said, well, you're not Robert Bly. If you are Robert Bly, you probably don't have to do a cover letter, or Billy Collins, or, you know, Mary Oliver. But if you're not any of those people, you need to do a cover letter. Okay. Um, all of these mistakes are in the front of this book, including, and you'll see, I, I think I gave you a copy of Heels that is a format in the right format. Here we go. Heels. Um, I gave you a copy of this, first of all, it's in the chat box. So, um, you'll see that no, no, you have to count the lines, and I, I looked this up, I think you, you include the stanza breaks as a line. So they want to, and you look, if you look it up, whether you're online or from Poets Market, they will tell you no more than blank number of lines. Follow the rules, because they will just, you'll be in the out pile right away. Uh, and what's tricky is if you have a two-page poem, you have to indicate when you start, is it the same stanza or a new stanza, because they won't do it. They won't intuitively know if it's the same stanza. So that's why I included that. 
Okay. So I started sending things out, and I'm going to show you the sort of truly true side of myself. People say to me, you're so organized. Well, if you had a head injury and you couldn't read or drive or work for six months, you'd be organized too. So I started just with, you know, paper. So this is what it now looks like. You know, uh, poems that were pending, because we should talk about simultaneous submissions, previously published poems, or fresh new poems. And then I decided I had to move from this very messy piece of paper. So you have a, I used to have a file of uh, pending, accepted, rejected, and pending. Then I realized I had to figure out, I knew where they were accepted, but I had to keep track of all the places that my poems were rejected. So I got a notebook, because I'm a hands-on person. There's only maybe three pages of accepted poems. And then I started, the, so it's a two, Part notebook. The first part, I try to write down every the name of every poem and where I send it to. Let me see if I can find one. I'll probably make it up if I can't. But um, for example, the one that finally won the International Publication Award for the Atlanta Review, which is Paper Root, was rejected by Off the Coast. Rejected by Ink. Inkwell, rejected by a grammar. And so then you think, this is a terrible poem. And then you send it to some place and they say, oh, of the 25 people who get an international publication award, your poem's it. So don't give up on your poems. Just don't. It's, it, it doesn't make any sense to you. Write well, revise well, take it to a group or a leader, take it to an open mic before you start sending them out. Okay. So, I went to a notebook, and what I can tell you is, for me, it's humbling to look at, for example, off the coast, rejected seizure, uh, liked paper root, but rejected it, rejected heels, rejected death of tea ticket hardware, rejected omen, rejected last glimpse of home, rejected cell phone psychosis, for the water issue, they rejected what what we what we water and in praise of summer rain, they rejected impulse buy, they rejected savings, they rejected tulip, they rejected free, they rejected el elegy for Irene, they finally accepted <coughs> after the funeral. So uh, I'm basically saying if you get discouraged, just sort of find somebody and run a by. Where do you think I should send it? In the group that meets at my house, um, periodically I'll hear a poem and I'll say, no, 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 don't send it there. Try Salomon for your poem. Because you know what? Don't aim too low and don't aim too high. And don't get discouraged because of the poems that got accepted, most of them were equally good as the ones that ended up in the journal. And just don't take it personally. Okay? That's the best advice I can give you. Now let me stop for a minute. And I'm going to do one more handout. Let me stop for questions and then I'll read a few of my own if that's okay with you. This I did for the Mashby Poetry Group. Mercifully, I'm such a bad Xeroxer that you don't know I did it on February 18th, 2012. What I did to get a strategy, and I'm going to say go to readings. It looks so sort of like this. It has, it is, I, it, at my office, I, I have front to back. Uh, the original only is on one side. So it's front to back. You will see. But what I did, um, the Nashville Poetry Group said, would you do something on getting published? I said, sure. Um, <clears throat> I made a, a list from the six seasons, or at that time, five seasons of Calliope. I went through all the bios, and I wrote down all the journals, and I made a note for C for Cape Cod. So I'm telling you that Salamander is user-friendly to Massachusetts poets. But it's a great journal, and you have to send your best stuff there, and don't get discouraged. I just recently got rejected from Salamander, even though I got a poem in earlier, because it's their 20th anniversary, and it's stiff. The Aurorian I'll talk about. Plowshares is very hard to get into. I think Susan Berlin has a poem there. She, Susan Berlin also has a poem in the Alaska Quarterly. Sometimes you should think about sending your poems to I don't know, the Georgia Review or 
Plain Songs in Nebraska because they want to be national journals. And you're from Massachusetts, you're from Cape Cod. So sometimes if you send them all to the Boston journals, you get a lot of rejections. Salamanders from Suffolk and Boston, I, I like the editors very much. The Aurorians from Maine, Plowshares is from Emerson, extremely hard to get into. And they have a guest editor, so you never know who's going to make the final decision. The Atlanta Review is a community journal. Actually, six poets who've read a calliope have gotten poems in Poetry Magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's also it's going to tell you something, that we get very good features who read a calliope. And we now have a two-year waiting list of people who want to read. So, uh, I, every time you see a C, it means that a Cape Cod poet got something there. Uh, Prairie Schooner, one of the Cape Cod poets. Uh, and I'll talk about Main Street Rag. Crab, Crab Orchard Review, I think that's Julia Davis. She did something in there. These are, these are good journals. Some of them are funky. Some of them are traditional. So if you don't have a sample, you're not going to know whether you're sending it to the right place or not. So, um, okay. That's the, the last handout that I'm going to go over. Any um, questions so far? If you, if you don't want to um, get, pay for samples for all these, can, can you get them at the library? I mean, I, I go online and you can see some of what they want. Sometimes they have a poem or two, but you really have to send out, send for... Why I'm suggesting it is the, accept, the acceptance rate for most good journals is like 5%. So if you don't, I'm sure they check. I'm sure they have better uh, tracking than my little notebook. So if I don't really send off for a sample, I, I decrease my chances from 5% to 1%. I'm not saying don't do it. I've broken my own rules a million times, but if I'm advising you to do it, I'm basically saying get Poets Market and follow what they tell you. And they'll say, get a sample. Mm -hmm. I came in a, in a little late. Subscribe to three or four journals a year. If you can't do three, do two. And Buddy up with somebody who has the other two. So you can say in your cover letter, I, I respected this poem in this journal. You know, this is the one that caused me to think maybe mine goes to you. Do your homework. If you don't do your homework, you're going to get way more, more discouraged by the rejections. And never get discouraged by the rejections. Um, okay, any other questions? <coughs> Bill. I have. Uh... A funny one about a rejection. I sent into the Atlantic Monthly, right? And said uh, on my poem, it might get great acceptance elsewhere. I had to break that up. My very first rejection, and I must admit, I, 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 I took great pleasure in this, was from a Boston, you'll, you'll notice I didn't put it on here. Uh, there are people who publish in Ibbotson Street, which is out of Somerville. It's a community journal, it's not an academic journal. The academic journals you shouldn't send at this time of the year because they're off for the summer. Usually your stuff is going to be reviewed by their MFA students or their uh, you know, creative writing students. And then they'll get to the, the editor. My first rejection basically said, I don't know what you think you're doing sending me anything at all. I sort of like heels, but it's really very weak, and I suggest you find a writer's group. This is after I had two writer's groups. Okay, so I know the name of the guy. I know where he lives, too. <laughs> I trailed where he was. He and I had poems and plain songs together. I ran into him and said, I liked your poem and plain songs, knowing he knew I had a poem where he did. He got a poem in the Aurorian at the same time I did. And I did the same thing the next time I saw him. Because you know what? The way to do it is just never let it get you down. Yeah. Just do it. And so that was, that was the first reject. It was literally the first journal I sent to him. It was the worst rejection letter I ever got. <laughs> Okay. Nice rejection. No, no, I've got many nice rejections. <laughs> and there are, for those who like uh, formal verse, there are uh, specific journals, verse, and um, measure tend to like formal verse. And, but I would, I would say, you know, really look at the sample 
and see if there is poems that remind you. And I would say, when you come to Calliope, I read, I always read the bios. The bios, as Marilyn would tell me, are very boring. Nobody is interested in where people are published, except for poets. Yeah. Why? Because I want to know when I hear somebody and they have something somewhere, then I'm going to say, gee, I maybe mean, I should send for a sample. And I'll give you a wonderful example. It's in your packet somewhere. You don't have to search. But everything pretty much now is online. So I gave you Poets and Writers has an online database. Part of the online data database, it will tell you the deadline, fiction, nonfiction, poetry. Um, and somebody in Boston had told me to really look for Hayden's Ferry Review out of Arizona. So I'm like, gee, I haven't really heard of Hayden's Ferry Re Review, but you know, maybe I should send away for that one. Okay. So I was reading at the Cape Cod Writers Center in April with John Bonani, who has a poem in the Hayden's Ferry Review. His poems are totally the opposite of my poems. So I'm like, gee, he likes the surreal, the collage poem. I don't write like that at all. So I just saved myself six dollars and waiting to get the Hayes Fair. It does be something that's for you, no matter how you write. You can't have this many journals out there and not find something. You just have to be deliberate and persistent. Okay, any other questions? I said I would talk about simultaneous submissions. Most of the good journals won't let you do that. They can hold up your poems for six months. So you have to write, have a deep pool of poems you're trying to get published. That's okay. Keep writing. Um, some will allow simultaneous submissions. That's why you have to write, write everything down. In my case, what happened, I submitted poems to the Atlanta Review and I sent the same ones to the Cultural Center's contest. Uh, the Atlanta Review picked Paper Root, so I had to say to Lauren, please take that away because that's been published, which is, you know, okay to do, but you have to, if you're going to send them out two places, keep track. I know one poet in Boston who said, what's the likelihood of me getting the same poem accepted by two journals? And she never followed the rules. She just said, it's never going to happen. We, we get so many rejections. It happened to her. And then she had a, you know, basically say to one of the editors of the two journals, you, I'm sorry, I submitted it to another journal inadvertently, which we knew wasn't inadvertent whatsoever. <laughs> she did it. So I personally just follow the rules. Uh, previously published. I'll give you an example. Let's see if I can give you an example. Some of the websites. I have a poem on um, the Mass Poetry blog, which is a website blog. It's called Poem of the Moment. And I looked and I, I realized once you publish online, you also kill your poem. So you can't publish it twice. And so I looked at all the poems, that they asked me to submit a poem, so I submitted a paper route, which was in the Atlanta Review, because I knew it was dead already. And they didn't mind that you submitted a previously published poem. So there are ways to do it, but I would say, in general, my general rule is I don't send out the same poem two places, and I, I follow the rules. I follow the online rules. If they don't want a previously published poem, I don't do it. Partly because I think it would just make me feel bad if I, I was being devious in some way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have to give credit if you steal like a, more than a line, or you know, do you have to give? And that actually, it's a sh short stories, okay? And I had an idea in a short story, and I it became a poem. Do I have to give credit? It's different. Mm -hmm. It's a poem. It's twisted all around. Do I have to give credit that it was? Was it your short story? Yeah. Oh. No worries. You can steal from yourself and you become like. Well, what, this is T.S. Eliot. It's not me talking. He said, minor po poets borrow, major poets steal. So <laughs> what you can't do is, what do they call it in school? Plagiarism. Plagiarism. You can't do that. But can you take something and change it around? Sure. We do it all the time. We just don't. We're mockingbirds. We sort of just borrow. Um, 
I don't know if Roger would mind me saying this. He probably would, but I'll say it anyway, because he's not here. He has a lovely chapbook. One of his poems um, was um, so close to Robert Frost, Acquainted with the Night, and he didn't realize it. So I read it, and I finally said to him, you might want to say it's after Robert Frost, because Robert Frost is so well known that it just, it was, he did, he likes formal poetry and it was in a certain form and he didn't want to change it. And so at first he freaked out that he had stolen Robert Frost. He said, we all, all have Robert Frost in our head somewhere. So just, you can attribute it to after. Um, I have many poems I've written in the style of another poet, so I, I'll say after Adrian Rich, you know, after this. So there's ways to do it and then some of the, Poetry collections, you'll see there's a footnote. Let's say somebody got something, it's a research poem. I've done a couple of research poems, and I'll say source at the bottom of the poem. You know, um, I've done a couple on the Arcadian deportation from Nova Scotia, and I just think that research poems are also worthy to do, and I just credit if it, I've taken it from another source. I did one. Well, James would remember, uh, uh, Robin would remember, I did one that was basically in Boston Globe. It was, a, it was so beautifully written, I just said, okay, I've got to make a poem out of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, as a, um, a epigraph, you know, Life on the Line, Billy Baker, Boston Sunday Globe, July 17th, 2010. So you attribute it, or in uh, some books, if you have a book, you put a footnote in the back, this, that covers you. But if you're stealing from yourself, you have no worries. Okay. And then I'm not going to say When you get published, and they don't want previously published poems, but that depends on how many books are published. You know, there's a, a number like... Self-published? No. I'm talking about... Can, if I publish in a very small, local... Well, for instance, the Catherine Lee ba Bates, they do a little booklet. Yep. Now, can I send that one out? Because so, I read somewhere, it might have been in the writer's market, that it, it depends. CLMP guidelines, something literary magazines and publications. If there's over 100 copies, then you can't. Then you can't. Okay. Brother? Um, if you have a poem that uh, is a finalist in a contest, but technically it's not really published, is that still, would it be all right to send that out? Yes. That's a lot of poem. If, what if I publish a poem on my blog? Is that considered publishing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the online, I think everything's going online. I've done this a couple of times where somebody said to me, will you... Um, Mass Poetry had a poetry of place, so I sent them Death of Tea Ticket Hardware. By the way, Death of Tea Ticket Hardware won an International Merit Award from the Atlanta Review. They then rejected it. They didn't want to publish it. And I, 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 I love Death of Tea Ticket Hardware. It's my favorite poem of everything I've ever written. And so finally I said, well, what the heck, I'll send it to this blog of poems of place. Then of course I realized, oh, I've just killed the poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so now it's also, uh, it's another online journal that didn't mind to previously publish. It's uh, the International uh, Journal of Psychoanalysis took it. So at least I feel like, okay, it had a little more readers. But yes, you have to be careful with online because it actually is published. Yeah. Yeah. Alice, I sent a column into Cape Women Online, which is not a poetry journal or anything. And then I sent it out to Avocet, and I told them that it had been published in Cape Women Online, but they published it anyway. Right, because so, some of the journals will. But that's why I'd say read. You don't have to do it by, uh, by hand. You just go online and look. Avocet now has a weekly Avocet where they're doing a lot more publishing online. Online is probably, I need to say, the wave of the future. Some will find. Um, the editor at uh, International Journal of Psychoanalysis didn't mind. You just disclose is essentially to rule. So, 
I send my daughter some of my poems and she sticks them on her YouTube account. Is that the same thing? Because I won't find them anymore. They're going to be dead. I wish I knew more about YouTube, but I would say probably don't do it. Facebook. Facebook? I don't know if Facebook counts as an online publication. I, I, I would say you anymore. might you might be safe, but you um, <laughs> might send your daughter kisses or cookies or something. I would think Facebook would be like a bug. Yeah, yeah so it gets it gets dicey, and yeah. I would say C L M P has all the guidelines. Um, what does that stand for? I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's a little of contemporary magazines and presses. We have a little bit of Nicole's in the house of great. And would you have a, an opinion about online? Yes. Um, we have somewhat strict guidelines um, at the right place at the right time. Um, and what we've informed people of, a lot of people think that if they publish on Facebook and they get a lot of views, or if they publish on a personal website or a blog, they feel that that's unpublished. And what we've had to explain to them is that once it's live, it has certain connotations and responsibilities that it has been seen, it has been read, and um, our policy is that we don't take previously published submissions. Um, so now we've had to stick that into our guidelines and spell it out where it hadn't been a consideration in our very first years, but now it's so popular that we've had to talk about it. And um, more and more writers have had questions on that. Yes. Um, so it's becoming more prevalent, and people have had a lot of problems putting their work up on Facebook. I don't recommend it. It's not really protected there. Mm -hmm. And editors will look askance at it in most cases. So um, it's just something for writers to think about. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you could answer that. We always take somebody sort of younger than me to answer those questions. But I would say, when in doubt, don't. You know, some of the onlines will accept previous. For example, in Falmouth, Spritzel, which is rabbit somewhere, which I didn't know what it was for years, and they thought I knew what Spritzel was, but I did not know that it is the journal of the Falmouth Historical Society. So I know that Jerita Davis has a couple of poems here. And uh, you know, they accepted a previously published poem. So you but when in doubt if if it's if they have information online, read it carefully, follow the rules, and um, there are some that will and some that won't. It depends on the, the nature of the journal and what it's uh, so I know that, for example, when uh, Nicole graciously accepted uh, B.B. Woods, I read it very carefully and I sent it off anyway, and I thought this is the right place for this particular poem. And I knew that that meant that it was published, and that's what it was. And it didn't matter, it was online. So, okay, any other questions? When, when something's published, do you, do you lose the rights to it? No, it reverts back, uh, and people have asked me this, most of anybody's poetry book that you get, including mine, will say something like, has an acknowledgments page where you put down where it's been published. Grateful acknowledgement is made to the pop following publication in which some of these poems have first appeared, some in an earlier version. So you can revise it if you're going to put it in the book, but it writes for and what happened. One of the poems that's in uh, of mine in the Cape Cod Poetry Review, they wanted on Cape Women Online. John Bonani said it re the rights revert back to you because Kim Baker wanted to do it and she had asked me if I could do it. But essentially, um, Yates revised his work for 30 years after the poem, the poem was published. You know, so I'm basically saying the rights revert back to the author if you're going to put it in a book, there should be an acknowledgement of where it first appeared. It doesn't have to be in exactly the same form. Hmm. Yes. But, but if you revise your own, it's considered a new poem. Um, not if it's been published under the, uh, for example, I changed the title of the poem. So I, anytime it's been published officially, mm -hmm. I, if you're going to put it in a book, you acknowledge where it was published. Okay. 
I had a poem published, and I and it was skating on bones. Is the poem? No, actually, it's called Tin Type on the Pond. And um, I looked. My brother looked up skating on bones, which was the, the title of a book, but that was a line in that poem. And he, they came up on a website that was selling antique jewelry, and they were, had my poem as their um, sales pitch or whatever you call it. Um, and it was my poem again, so I, it was Esty. Has anybody heard of Esty? Oh, yeah. yes. So I, I, I wrote to them and said, why, do, how do you have my poem advertised? They were, it was the antique jewelry and everything. And then it was gone, it came off, but. I'm sure there are a lot of violations like this, but it te technically, um, the rights revert back to the author. <clears throat> so, uh, and what John did was he immediately sent Kim back to me to see if I would approve that it would be on, Women online. So if it's all right, can I read a book? Oh, we're all on. Um, I'm thinking of starting my own blog. Uh -huh. And if I, so it would seem like I should only put poems on it that have been already published, because if I put an unpublished poem that I might like to submit somewhere else, I shouldn't put it there. And I also, as I, you probably know, I really support the Mass Poetry Festival. I just sent off to their bad poetry contest three poems that I hope never get published anywhere. Because, and I wrote to Steve Almond, who just read here in Fama for what's found with reading. I said, I hope I come in last in your bad po poetry. Uh, so <laughs> so let, me, let me do this a little more personally. And I'm trying not to just be self aggrandizing, although I probably am a little. And I'm going to end with a very happy story about the latest thing I just just found out yesterday. Just got published. So, um, the Aurorian. The Aurorian. Try the Aurorian. If you don't have a big bio, the Aurorian's out of Maine. Cynthia uh, Vincent Brackett is the editor. It tends to be uh, uplifting, positive poems. It tends not to like the dark and the gritty. Um, so I'll just read, this is, I'm going to read a couple, sh I'm going to read some short poems. This was in the fall and winter of 2009, 2010, Weeping Beach, and the epigraph, Forest Hills Cemetery, Boston, Massachusetts. There's a Weeping Beach like this in B.B. Woods, and actually Betty Jameson has two wonderful pastel paintings in the lobby <coughs> that shows the tree that's here in Falmouth, but this is one that's in Boston. <clears throat> Weeping Beach. Serpent roots and ladder limbs climb beyond all agony of mind. Its golden leaves reflect particular light, perpetual. This weeping beach witnesses the salt of sorrow, the last shovel full of amen. Sit in the wise one's lap and hear it whisper, be with the living now or be restless with the dead. And because uh, Christina's in the house and she's doing the um, haiku contest, which I encourage you to submit to, they also do haiku. So I'm working on it my first, um, well, I'm working on it, but I've sent out to 20 different uh, contests my first full-length poetry manuscript, which is now called, it depends on what day of the week, it's now called Born Bridge. <laughs> so, um, it was called Half a Dream, Half a Vision a couple months ago. And in the um, sort of dedication is a published haiku. Beneath this bridge, barnacles cling to summer. Mm -hmm. That's also what they are. Okay, Abbasset uh, just changed um, publishers. I got three poems accepted in these two journals. Um, the new publisher's name is Charles Portolano. Um, and, and now, oh, a stash of papers. I'm sure it's in your packet. There's the weekly Abbasset, uh, and there's four, he publishes four times a year, and you should send things off now because he says that he, if you send it late in the submission period, you have less chance of getting in. That is also true, I think, in a lot of the journals. So if you wait to the last minute, you're not likely to get read because they're in the 
the, the deadline period off. So I'm going to read just one from Abbasset and say, um, for example, this time Betty Jameson was on the same one as me, which was great. Okay, I'm going to read the shorter of the two, and it's about a flower. And you can imagine which flower it is, but I'll tell you the truth. It's about a peony. Okay. <clears throat> Diva. Lit from within, each soft cream petal unfurling with a little delicate curl at the tip like whipped meringue, a stillness suggesting motion, their sweet, smooth fullness revealing erect gold threads. No wonder the bees are rubbing and buzzing like Ella doing coal. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if that one would have gotten into Aurora and it was a little sexier than her. I think it's a little sexier than her. Uh, I might not read this. This is, um, I'm just bringing it, this is Blue Lines. It's the literary magazine dedicated to the spirit of the Adirondacks. It did publish um, a poem that's in the chat book, August Nights. So, but you don't send seashore poems to, you, if you have a mountain poem, this is a great journal. It's SUNY Potsdam. And again, you don't send it towards the end of an academic year. Usually, um, their reading periods are either September to November and January through March, something like that, uh, because they, they break. So um, that's another nature-oriented, because I know we have not a lot of nature writers. Um, You've been using the word chapbook, and I've heard many other writers use it. I think it's something very old, but could you tell us what is a chapbook? Um, mm. A chapbook is usually, uh, it has to be 48 pages or less, usually saddle-stitched uh, or uh, Sometimes it has a, a hard binding, I'm trying to think. But, and it does have a long history. I don't know if it was Walt Whitman who started it, but it's definitely, usually if they're self-published or, Jury Davis gave me the advice to do a, a chat book. Um, because you had a certain type of literature? Uh, you, well, poetry, I don't know if I've I seen mean, are, okay, are chat books always poetry? I don't, know. It's, it's I don't think, I think originally they go back to the, even the Middle Ages, where um, the pe local peddlers would go around the villages mm -hmm. and sell these little stories, and they could be literature stories or fables or, mm -hmm. you know, just way before people actually had magazines or books. They're relatively, I used a new way of printing here in Falmouth to do it, I did 50 copies. You sell, if you're lucky, you sell five books at a reading, if you're lucky. Um, so that would last me maybe 10 years. So I figured by that time, maybe I'd get the full collection out. It, costs, it depends on how many mistakes you make in proofreading. I've made a million mistakes in proofreading, and every time I think it's done, I find another one. So I would only get 10 made at a time because I was always finding mistakes. They cost about $3 to, pub, to produce. Um, so if you sell them for eight, you make five. If you sell, you sell them for, and there are wonderful other, uh, Finishing Line Press is a great, yeah, Joan? Um, I've done five, and I do them myself. I do all the artwork and the content on my word processor, my computer. And um, recently, I've taken them to Staples. And they charge the least of any place that I've gone to. And they give you a good product. And they'll fix anything that's wrong. They'll won't okay. charge you to fix it. And I think I, I chose a small businesswoman as my personal staples. Who who? And Roger did his at New Wave, and we did Lynn McDonald's at New Wave. So, but they are inexpensive, and if you decide you want to change them, it, it's not going to break the bank. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do it just a couple. Yes. I have, I have a chapbook out of Meditations that is raising money for the Penn women. So you can do other than poetry. Oh, yeah. um, I'm going to try to keep track of the time. How are we doing? Not okay. 10? Okay. All right, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the one that has your, it's a wonderful story. Okay, plain songs. Remember I said sometimes send it somewhere else? This is from Hastings College in Nebraska. 
I think before dreaming got re rejected by a lot of things and all of a sudden it got picked up. So um, look at it. Prairie Schooner is the University of Nebraska. Lincoln, where Ted Kuzer is, this is very hard to get into. This is not hard to get into, in my opinion. <clears throat> Before dreaming. She curled into a question mark of not quite sleep, wondering what becomes of wrongs and slights as sharp as cheddar without the sweet apple of sorry. Do they become that lobster dream? You know the one where you get lost, take the wrong exit off the bridge, get stuck in traffic behind the perpetual construction project, leave the car in frustration, forget your shoes and purse, get yelled at by the female cop for abandoning the teddy bear in the back seat, then walk through all those lobsters pinching at your feet. She knows what her therapist would say. You are everything and everyone in your dream. A lot of help that is. <laughs> He's the lobster, not me, she always complains. That nitpicking nitwit sleeping so soundly, it's annoying. Lying like the exclamation point of righteousness, remembering none of his dreams. Maybe we are different species, a collie and an ostrich, not meant to mate or just two porcupines shivering, quills of protection, no comfort at all, her last foggy thought before dreaming. <laughs> they also picked up on one of the Cape poems, I won't read it, it's also in the chapbook, which actually they sell the chapbook for $5 and it goes to fund the Calliope Post stipend. So this is what means in October, ecstasy. So sometimes if you're a Cape poet, you might want to send it up to the Great Plains where they're looking for what we've got all around us. They're looking for interesting um, uh, poets from other parts of the country. Okay. Now this is, okay. Let me do the mistakes first. I made a couple of mistakes. I'm going to tell you these things that mm, you send up usually three to five poems. They tell you no more than a block. Don't ever send more than they want. Some of them want five to seven, some of them want three to five. Hardly any of them want one or two. So I went after, um, I went after Salamander. Roger got there first. And I said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And it only took me, I don't know, three years. And I sent off, I thought, pretty strong poems. They picked the one that I am not totally behind. So every once in a while you get accepted where you want, and then you think, oh, why that poem? And then, you know, and everybody says, oh, you got into Salamander and all. This was a poem I wrote when I was in a bad mood. And it's a tone poem. It has Salamander tends uh, the Worian, Abbasset, blue lines like nature. Plain songs will do some things with narrative, which is why I like it. Uh, Salamander doesn't do as much humor as it does sort of almost tone poems. You know, so this will tell you the tone I was in, which is not I'm not proud of it. <clears throat> Betrayals. The procedure, intrusive, like the paparazzi, should be done in the right eye, not the wrong one. The paint chip crocus should make the clabbards look its name, not the purple of a circus. The third new trash barrel should be left at the bottom of the driveway, not thrown into traffic for roadkill. The tenants should pay their rent or leave the place as they found it. The world should be as it ought to be, as it ought, as I thought it would be. The phlebotomist should hit the vein by the third try. <laughs> <laughs> and this is another one. This is a more gritty journal, Main Street Rag. It also does a chapbook contest, and it also has a full collection contest. Um, Alan Feldman and Tommy Hoagland did a free uh, workshop on the Lower Cape of the Wellfleet Library. Anybody who knows Tony Hoagland, he's very brilliant, out of the box, witty, a little dark actually, but 
nonetheless, he did this for free, and it would cost you a lot of money to take a workshop with Ellen Feldman and Tony Hoagland, and they did it for free for years. Mm -hmm. So the prompt was, you go down there, you do these poems, you read from the poems, and then you do an in-class writing exercise. So <laughs> Tony's thing was, write your most self-deprecating, most humiliating you know, thing. So this is the poem, and it actually got published. Mm -hmm. And I want to say it was written by Tony Hoagland rather than it was written by me. So the, it, the, the prompt got me a poem, the poem went, and uh, the other poem that's in Manuscript Rag that I won't read because I don't want to take the time is when I write, it, I write dark poems at the dark time of year. So this one is called If I Wake Up Dead, the pink post-it note said, and it's a list poem oh. of all the things. So, you know, it's like my obsessive compulsive. So I had to write a list in case I woke up dead, somebody would know what to do in my absence. <laughs> so they, they picked that one and they picked this one. <clears throat> Sunnyside Manor. I hated the undressing. Lifting the dead weight, swinging the legs, lowering her into the water. Too hot, no, too cold. So I began to run the bath, all hot, to watch her flinch, control the berating. Those scaly feet, those cottage cheese legs and droopy breasts, the smell of yeast rising. Quick, swab the folds below, Shampoo the gold gray hair, hear the yell, my eyes. So I began to forget the extra towel, one to sit on, one to dry her. I'd leave, breathe, come back when she was shivering. Lift, dry, powder, dress her. That Saturday, I'm sorry, that Sunday I slide into her room to take the lunch tray and found her crying. Mother's Day. No cards, no visitors. My thought, of course not. So that's not a poem I would have said I really wanted out there, but those, those were my mistakes. <laughs> if you're not fully behind the poem, it's likely that that's the one that one of these journals <laughs> um, And I think what I'm going to do in the service of time is I'm just going to end, I think I'll end with this one. I, I I'll end with this one. Everything else is in the chat book. This is, this is the last copy that I have to sell of the Cape Cod Poetry Review for $10. The good news is there is going to be a second issue. They've sold enough to make the Cape Cod Poetry Review solid. And I'm so That's proud of John Donani and Gemma Leghorn and Gregory Fishcack, who's a contributing editor. It's like, why didn't we have Calliope six years ago? Nobody thought of it. Why didn't we have a Cape Cod Poetry Review? So they did it without any funding. They just said this is the right thing to do, and I'm just so thrilled. So um, this is the way I'm going to end with a, a tip of the hat to Suzanne. Um, the first year I did Mutual Muses, I received your uh, JPEG of Blue Bureau, and there's a number after it. Okay. And um, I sat with that, and it has. Um, Force narcissus in it, I think, or daffodils. Anyway, you'll see, hear it in the poem. So when I knew that you were the person who was running this today, I thought uh, I'll read this. I've got two poems in the Cape Cod Poetry Review. Um, actually, one that was rejected by the right place at the right time. <laughs> 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 And it, it'll show you that one of the uses of it. one of the uses of how to credit things is an epigraph. Uh, actually, some of you may remember Irene Harris. She's a wonderful poet. Um, she had uh, pancreatic cancer and kept outrunning her. You know, they give her prognosis and she 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 get a remission and she'd do it again and again. So when she died, uh, she read a Calliope the second season. I was shocked because I never thought it was going to get her. Even, and she lived that life. She lived this incredible life. So um, I got your beautiful uh, painting, or a picture of the painting, which has a blue bureau, a, a mirror behind the bureau, and some forced narcissus. And um, 
Roger Kessel and I, but mainly Roger, wanted to put together a chapbook of her poems posthumously. So the other thing I would say, get your poems in order, please, if anything happens to you. <laughs> um, keep, and have a literary uh, executor. So this is used with permission by Grove Harris, the literary executor of Irene Harris, and it has an epigraph, which I'll read before I read the title. <clears throat> And another regrettable thing about death is the seeking is this I'm sorry. And another regrettable thing about death is the ceasing of our own brand of magic. John Updike. Elegy for Irene. In the three season porch, force narcissus. Its haunting smell breaks the spell of winter. Propped behind the blue bureau, a forgotten mirror refracting gold-green spring and periwinkle memories of those elfin eyes alive with mischief. Then her chin tucks in and the gaze deepens. Splayed across the wicker chaise in her spiral notebook, these piquant lines of shivery beauty, daffodils in winter. It seemed a happy miracle, our indoor crowd, such an enduring performance lasting for days, and yet when each began to hang her head, I felt strangely comforted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Center along with the poems. And then, as the artists, we were given a poem that we had to produce a painting to. So it's nice now to know what's behind that poem and what inspired you to do it. So that's really, cave's a small place. <laughs> but also, when you were, um, when Alice was talking about enter, 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 and you rejects. Artists are told if you don't collect reject letters, you're not working. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of artists just get devastated. Yeah. Absolutely devastated. Mm -hmm. But there's all kinds of stories about people who send a painting in one year and it gets rejected. This friend of mine happened to her in Boston. She wouldn't paint a whole year. Her friends took the same painting without telling her sent it to the same art show in Boston the next year. It not only got in, it was on the poster and on the catalog cover. Oh, okay. So you always have to say, depends who the judge is and what side of the bed they got up in the morning. <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing everything. Oh, That's just a little something oh, for thank you. you. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much, Alice. All right. So we have um, iced tea and some very nice cookies and just stay around and network with people and, and if you want to buy the, the